So I'm, I'm working in, in London, so our institute was just renamed this January, so I'm in the same place, but they renamed the Institute London Institute of Medical Sciences, because I thought that it was more catchy. I'm not sure about that, but they just changed the name. And I'm going to talk about senescence, that is one of, the, of my main interests, interest, and the link between senescence and, and inflammation. So senescence <coughs> is a concept that came from the 1960s, where Leonard Heifrich, trying to figure out how to grow viruses to, to produce vaccines, started to grow normal cells. And what he figured out, his intention was just to grow these normal cells to expand viruses in, in normal cells instead of in cancer cells. But what we figure out is that these normal cells, they proliferate just for a limited space of time. And they reach this uh, state that he calls senescence after replicative exhaustion. And how long does it take depends on what's the origin of the cells and how the cells are cultured. But eventually they reach this uh, state. And this uh, state is defined mainly because it is a, an irreversible or a, at least a highly stable growth arrest. So that the cells, even if they are put in the presence of growth factors or, or serum, they still uh, remain arrested mainly in G1. So that's the, the main definition of senescence. But a part of that, there are another a number of characteristics that has been uh, identified during the years. And there is a pattern that usually we just identify this as a way to characterize senescent cells, but later we realize that also they contribute to the senescent phenotype. So the, the senescent cells typically are flat and enlarged. They, they have this senescence-associated beta-gal activity that reflects an increase in lysosomes and, uh, and, and effects on autophagy function. They have this fossa in the nuclei that is a consequence of this heterochromatin fossa that happened to, amongst other things, to heterochromatinize and repress cell cycle genes. So they are also involved in the function. And it was known for quite a while that senescent cells secrete a lot of mainly pro-inflammatory factors in what is known the senescence-associated secretory phenotype. And that's something that is, uh, is very interesting and that we have been studying for more than for almost uh, a decade. And I, I will talk about this, most of uh, this talk. So a lot of the interest that comes, that we have today on senescence, uh, uh, starts not from the, the initial studies, but from a study that, that started in 1997, showing that senescent cells or that oncogenes can trigger senescence. And this was uh, basically uh, expanded in 2005 with a number of studies that showed that this Oncogen-induced senescent response, so a senescence-like response triggered by oncogenes, happens in in vivo in preneoplastic lesions. So, for example, this is a, a lung, a, trans a transgenic lung expressing KRAS, and here we have like some normal cells of the lung. So we have a preneoplastic lesion that is is benignant, but that is enriched in senescent cells, and we have a more malignant, in this case, an adenom adenocarcinoma, and this is an adenoma. And this more malignant lesion is the void of senescent cells. So the, the model that, that uh, people came with, and that it seems to, to be at least uh, true for a number of, of human cancer, is that during cancer progression, at the time that the tumors or, or the cells become like more and more malignant, in parallel in this premalignant state, there is a, a activation of senescence. And this senescence response basically precludes or, or slows the, the progression to a more malignant state. And to progress to a more malignant state, you need to basically bypass or cancel the senescent response. So a lot of the interest that we have on senescence came from this wave of papers starting at the end of the 1990s, in which they saw that senescence is a tumor suppression mechanism for cancer. But more recently, there has been, uh, again, an increase of interest in, in senescence. And that came from from two or three different uh, kind of uh, studies. So one has been the, the, the progressive realization that senescent cells are not just present <coughs> during, uh, not just accumulate during aging or are present in premalignant lesions, but we can identify them in a lot of, ma of different uh, diseases. And in many of these diseases that go from different type of fibrosis to, the, to uh, neurodegenerative disease to for example, uh, optic uh, eye diseases like cataract, or glaucoma, osteoarthritis, and many, many others. In there, we are starting to classify the role of senescence. And in, in some cases, senescence is beneficial. Senescence, for example, is a tumor suppressor mechanism and can limit more types of fibrosis. 
But in many other cases, the accumulation of senescent cells is detrimental. So the accumulation of senescent cells can promote, also in the context of cancer, some, some uh, tumor characteristics and contributes to this a sterile degree of inflammation mediated through the SASP to a lot of pathologies. And this accumulation of senescent cells, so that was like the start of the realization that senescence could be involved in many pathologies. So and the second, or the second and, th and third uh, big uh, uh, breakthroughs came from genetic and pharmacological studies that show that if we eliminate senescent cells, we have a lot of increases in not just in uh, lifespan, but also in the health span or, or mice. So initially, all this came from uh, work in the Jan van Dersen lab, in which he developed mouse models in which senescent cells could be killed in an inducible way by adding a drug that triggered the dimerization of an suicide gene, so in this case a, a, a inducible uh, way of uh, inducible uh, caspisate that was under the control of, of a senescence promoter. So what these studies show is that if you eliminate senescent cells, and you could do it by giving this drug that uh, artificially killed the senescent cells, you could increase the lifespan, increase the health span, and we are just seeing more and more diseases. So the last count is something like 25 different diseases, many associated with AIDS, that get some improvement if you eliminate the senescent cells. So the second wave of, of uh, breakthroughs came followed by, by an, an obvious search. So if you could do this in a genetic model, the question was, was it possible to find chemical compounds that you could use to specifically kill senescent cells and could these compounds have similar effects. And people call these compounds senolytic. And the first uh, uh, research papers identifying some of these came like past year. So the most promising family so far is this BCL2 family of inhibitors. And they can selectively kill senescent cells, many types of senescent cells. And they have like uh, benefits on, for example, rejuvenating hematopoietic stem cells, but also in reducing ater aterosclerotic plagues and many others. So potentially there is this big interest in trying to identify compounds that kill senescent cells. And as I mentioned, so these BCL2 family of inhibitors are so far the, the gold standard, but they have problems. So for example, the, there are like three compounds in this family, that's uh, three main compounds. So the first one was this 737. That has problem because it's not uh, uh, very, uh, uh, very. It has not very good pharmacokinetics. So this ABT263 was just developed later on, and it was taken to at least phase one clinical trials. <coughs> but the side effects are like significant uh, neutropenia and thromb thrombocytopenia. And the thing is that there are other compounds that have been developed. So all of these were developed initially to treat leukemias. And the, the other compounds, basically, they have uh, eliminated the side effects, but they have eliminated the side effects, and they are not longer senolytic. So we cannot use them as senolytic compounds. That is not what they were like developed. So there's the need for identifying novel senolytics. And that's something that I just want to mention in two slides that we are <coughs> trying to do in our lab. So we are just looking for compounds that potentially kill senescent cells more efficiently than normal cells. And we have a few candidates, and we are comparing those with, for example, this ABT family of compounds. <coughs> and what we can see in different systems in vitro is that, and what we are comparing, comparing here is like the, the gray bars are normal cells and the blue bars are senescent cells. It's, for example, here we have like an example of three compounds that are able to kill senescent cells more efficiently or at least as efficiently as Navitoclax, so this BCL2 family of compounds. And what we know so far is that at least some of the side effects of the Cinavitoclax, they are not present in these compounds. The other thing that, that we are starting to look is the ability of these compounds to work in vivo, of course. And this is just preliminary data in which we trigger senescence by treating mice with uh, chemotherapy or with irradiation. And what we can see is that the number of senescent cells <coughs> increase when we irradiate the mice. So we are looking specifically in the lung. And if we treat with these this ABT compounds, so we just decrease the number of senescent cells, and that results in improvement of, of certain uh, health uh, uh, phenotypes. 
And what we can see is that we have like some compounds that we are just showing here of the ones that we have identified that potentially they work as nicely as the EBT and we don't have these side effects of this niche opinion and, and, and the rest. So potentially there is a, a huge interest <coughs> in trying to look for these analytic compounds and we and others are looking for those. But one of the questions is why eliminating this senescent cell is so beneficial for a big number of pathologies? Because very often senescent cells are just a, a small percentage of the cells that are present in the tissue and still if you eliminate them with the, some of these uh, genetic models or, or with these pharmacological models you get like huge improvements in some of the phenotypes. And one of the, the things that people has hypothesized and that we are just researching and, and looking into that is precisely because of the SASP, because of this senescence associated secretory phenotype. So the SASP, we just mentioned it before, is how we refer to the fact that senescent cells secrete a complex mix of factor of different factors that are mainly pro-inflammatory, but not just. So include also chemokines, cytokines, many growth factors, proteases, and many others. And the interesting thing is that all of these factors being secreted has the influence to has the ability to influence the surrounding microenvironment in many ways. And of course, because they are secreted factors, they can also be targeted therapeutically. So we have been working for a number of years in characterizing those. And we have been working in, in our systems of oncogenic induced senescence. And we have done mass spec and characterized and defined a number of factors that are secreted and that are like upregulated in senescent cells. And amongst them, there are like inflammatory things, like for example, CCL2, CCL20, IL8, IL6. But there are also, like we mentioned, like for example, factors of the TGF beta or the BMP family. And there are like also vascular endothelial growth factors and, and many others. And the interesting thing is, is that the senescent secretome can mediate many phenotypes. So for example, in the context of cancer, so it has been shown and that's, that has been work mainly conducted by the Judith Campisi lab in the States, that a lot of these pro-inflammatory factors, so even if senescence itself is a tumor suppression mechanism, a lot of those pro-inflammatory factors can have a, a pro-tumorogenic effects. They can contribute to enhance EMT, to increase tumor proliferation of pre-existing tumor cells, to increase invasion or to increase angiogenesis. But that's not the whole story. So a lot of the factors also secreted by senescent cells, what they do is, is basically recruit and activate both the innate and adaptive immune systems in order to uh, establish what is an extrinsic arm of tumor suppression. So these, for example, factors secreted by, se by preneoplastic senescent cells will activate and recruit both the innate and adaptive immunity and these immune cells will basically eliminate these senescent cells. So it will be just an extra way of, of trying to eliminate these preneoplastic cells in the context of cancer. And what my group and others have shown is that a part of that, factors secreted by senescent cells can contribute to reinforce the senescence growth arrest and also to induce senescence into normal cells in a paracrine fashion. And overall, what that, that uh, uh, draws is a, compli a complex picture in which modifying some of these phenotypes can be interesting, but we have to try to understand what are the components or what are the secreted factors that contribute to one or to, to others. So I'm going to just introduce a couple of, of the things that I mentioned previously in this slide, some of these phenotypes. So I'm going to talk slightly about some of these immune recruitment function <coughs> of the, of the senescence uh, cells through the senescence secretome and the fact that senescence can be reinforced. So I'm, I'm going to do that because later some of the data will be interesting for the rest of the talk. But a model that we use, and this was developed by Lars Sender in, that is in, in Tübingen, is, is this model of, uh, of uh, liver uh, cancer pre-initiation or the initiation of liver cancer in which what we do is we, you can inject two plasmids. So it's just DNA that you inject using hydrodynamic telvein injection. So you just inject it in, in a big volume at a high speed. And what that does is, is basically reverse the flow of the, of the, of the vein, the vein cave. And then it just, you, you achieve a transduction in the liver, mainly in the liver. And because we use a system that uses a transposone and a transposis vector, you eventually achieve something like 15% of a sta a stable integration in hepatocytes in two or three days. And what Lars 
that established this system so is that if you express a RAS, a non cogenic form of RAS, what you achieve is, is this initially something like 15% of hepatocytes that are expressing RAS, and here we have a comparison between oncogenic RAS and a mutant that is not non-active and non-oncogenic. So when you have the oncogenic RAS, you can see that it's signal to phosphoerc, and it induces senescence. You have this induction of senescence, beta-gal, P21, and so on. When you, you, when you just uh, transduce this non-oncogenic RAS, so it's non-active, so it has this mutation that doesn't engage in with ERK, doesn't have the phosphoerc activity, doesn't trigger senescence, and so on. And one thing that you look is that if you uh, start to look uh, on time, like a couple of weeks after the initial transduction, for example here is at day 12, the number of cells that are RAS positive when you are just triggering senescence is less than when you not don't trigger senescence. So basically what is happening is, and that's something that is generalizable to other systems, is that once you trigger senescence, these senescent cells secrete factors, and through these factors recruit the immune system, and depending on which is the situation, you have a combination, for example, in these senescence uh, premalignant lesions of uh, macrophages, NK cells, and also a CD4 T uh, cell dependent response. And this senescence sur sur immune surveillance response basically eliminate this, this uh, pre incipient premalignant cells. So basically we can use this model to follow up senescence, to follow up the, the production of the SASP, the recruitment of the immune system, and the elimination of these senescent cells. And that we can do in, in something like two, three weeks, so it's, it's quite a, a nice system. So other of the things that, that we saw that, that the SASP can do is to induce senescence. And it, there are factors of the SASP, like we define like CC, CXCL2 and some of these uh, CXCR2 dependent um, chemokines that basically reinforce the senescent growth arrest. And one of the questions that we have is, is it possible for senescent cells through, them, through some of these secreted factors to induce paracrine senescence, to induce senescence into normal cells? And the answer that we just came by using different system is yes. So there is the possibility of senescent cells to trigger senescence into normal cells through these secreted factors. And to try to disentangle this response, and I just want to solve this to, to try to see why we, we became interested in understanding how the SASP is regulated, what we did is a combination of, of uh, descriptive studies, so mass spec, and screenings. And what we identify is first, as I mentioned before, what factors are secreted by senescent cells. And we identify something like 124 factors that are secreted factors induced during in senescent cells. And we couple that with some uh, screenings in which we use drugs that are targeting the receptors of these factors or these pathways. So we assemble something like a collection of 84 drugs that we're, tra we're targeting some of the, of the receptors or the pathways engaged by these factors. And we look, basically try to, to, to address the question of which of the factors that are secreted by senescent cells are responsible of this paracrine senescent response. And what we saw is that there was like multiple factors, there was redundancy, there were multiple factors that could be involved in this paracrine senescent response. There were like a part of, of uh, cytokines that bind to CXCR2, there were like factors of the TJ beta family, CCL2, so uh, inhibition of the CCR2 receptor also had this effect, even VEGF, and some others that were able to, when we just uh, inhibit them, block this paracrine senescent <coughs> response. And conversely, when we express some of these uh, secreted factors, we could induce a paracrine response. So one of the things that we learned from this, and this was just one single phenotype of the many that the SASP uh, controls, is that there is a lot of redundancy in these responses, and that if we wanted to interfere with some of the phenotypes of the SASP, and alternatively a, stat a strategy instead of just trying to target individually some of these factors, could be target the regulation. And, and that's what I'm going to talk in the rest of this talk. And this is just a summary of what we know how the SASP is regulated. So at the transcriptional level, we know that is an inflammatory response, is controlled by NF-kappa-B, and also by CBP-beta. And there has been implications, for example, of the DNA damage response, of P38, and pot potentially like very positive uh, reinforcing feedback loops, uh, 
by IL-8, IL-6 and many others that contribute to enhance the response. And there's also like negative regulation by microRNAs. And what we started is to, to try to understand in a, in a very uh, a small way to try to, to understand whether we could identify novel ways of regulating the SASP. So we take a modest approach and we take just something like 35 compounds or so that we just uh, choose because they were like targeting different pathways that were like important for signal transduction in senescent cells. And we look into what was happening into the induction of, of six factors of the SASP that were important for some of the functions of the SASP. So we look into IL-8, IL-6, CCL20, inhibin A, that is a, a member of the TJ beta family, interleukin 1-beta and VGF. And for example, we identified NF-kappa B inhibitors, as it was known, that are able to repress or, or prevent the induction of the SASP. A lot of these factors, so, so all of these, that, uh, a lot of these compounds, all of these in yellow, they don't do nothing, they don't do anything. And what we identified were like, in this screen, is were like two compounds. On one hand, interleukin-1 inhibitors, and on the other hand, rapamycin, that were able to repress the SASP. And one of them, so interleukin-1, what we, and we published this uh, five years, four or five years ago, what we identified with interleukin-1 is that interleukin-1 was controlling both the senescence growth arrest and the secretion of these pro-inflammatory factors. So uh, in the two ways, if we inhibit interleukin-1 or if we overexpress interleukin-1, we could see in this case, we here have some data over the, oh, in the, with the overexpression, that when we overexpress interleukin-1, we basically induce a, a SASP response, so we induce the secretion of all these factors, and we induce also, we're able to mimic this senescence growth arrest. So and the other compound that we identified was rapamycin. And rapamycin, we'll see, was interesting because it was able to dissociate these two effects. So rapamycin, what, what it is, as everybody knows, is an, a natural inhibitor of mTOR. And mTOR is a uh, very important cellular pathway that integrates a lot of upstream signals and controls cellular processes such as protein translation, lipid synthesis, or autophagy, integrating signals that come from energy stress to growth factors and many others. And we'll go through that, but mTOR has many effectors, but we will just mainly concentrate in two of them that are controlling protein synthesis, that are acid kinases and this 4 EBP, this, this uh, binding protein of the initiation factor 40. And what we did first is try to repeat what we identified in the screening. So we have identified that rapamycin regulates the SASP, inhibits the SASP. So we use like three different inhibitors of mTOR, and we see that we inhibit the expression of SASP components. We expanded and we did some mass spec, and we identified <laughs> that when we inhibit in this case with SHRNAs against mTOR, but the same is true with inhibitors of, rapa of, of mTOR, like rapamycin or taurin, what we achieve is a substantial inhibition of this secretory phenotype. So that we inhibit or we prevent the induction of something like half of the factors secreted by senescent cells. But what I want to mention is that, importantly, we are not unspecifically inhibiting everything that is secreted <coughs> by senescent cells. So there is some specificity, and there is like a, a broad response. So we are repressing roughly more than half of the factors secreted by senescent cells. And just to mention, we, we show that different drugs that inhibit mTOR, different SHRNAs, in inducing senescence in di uh, with different in inducers and different cell types, in all of them, the inhibition of mTOR resulted in this inhibition of the SASP. So it seemed to be a, a general effect. And <coughs> as I was just hinted before, one of the things why we become interested in trying to, to understand this regulation of the SASP by mTOR is because Interleukin, with interleukin-1, we were both affecting the growth arrest and affecting this, the, this secretory phenotype. But when we inhibit mTOR, like for example in this case we are using taurin-1, we could dissociate the effect that we have on the pro-inflammatory factors from the growth arrest. So when we inhibit mTOR during senescence, the growth arrest persisted. So for example, here we, we can see the incorporation of BRDU cells that we have treated with mTOR inhibitors remain arrested. They didn't grow. 
but we prevented the induction of these stars. So we, we thought that it was interesting from the point of view that we will dissociate this growth arrest from the expression of these pro-inflammatory factors. And we tried to understand how this was working, so mechanistically. So we look into mainly these this two uh, targets downstream of mTOR for EVP and Nessus kinase, and we interfere with them in different <laughs> ways, using, for example, 4-EBP dominant negatives, or we use SHRNAs or uh, chemical inhibitors of SS kinase. So what we think is that both of the pathways to some extent regulate the SASP, but the strongest effect that <coughs> we saw was when we inhibit 4-EBP with uh, dominant negatives. So that's why we concentrate on trying to understand how 4-EBP controls the SASP. 4-EBP is a factor that regulates global translation, but it not just regulates uh, and specifically global translation, but it has a differential effect on regulating the translation of certain mRNAs that have a specific motifs in the 5' prime, and that 4-EBP uh, regulates basically the association of these mRNAs with the polysomes, and once that they associate with this poly these polysomes are the ones that are translating, and we have like translation initiation. And what we did is to we rescue this, this machine from the 1960s that was like able to fraction these ribosomes and do this, this, poly this uh, basically these polysome fractions. And we could just look into what we can see here is like the distribution of, of uh, from subunits of the ribosome to single ribosomes to these polysomes. And these polysomes are the ones that will be associated with mRNAs that are being translated. And we could basically isolate RNAs that were mRNAs that were associated with one fraction or the other. And th the point here is that the RNAs, the mRNAs that are associated in the polysome fraction are the ones that are being translated. So we know that if we inhibit mTOR, what we are inhibiting is the association of these mRNAs or, or through 4-EBP, the association of mRNAs or a specific mRNAs to this polysome fraction. And for example, one canonical target of uh, 4-EBP and mTOR is this EEF2, and there are others like this RPS20. Uh, and what we can see here is that if we treat cells with taurine, so in the top, if we look into the blue, so w there is like 33% of the, of the EF2 mRNA that is associated with polysomes. If we treat with taurine, that is an mTOR inhibitor, this drops to something like 7%. So there's a specific effect on some of these mRNAs, and typically these mRNAs have like some structures in the, in the, in the, in the five prime that, that uh, explain that. So our initial hypothesis was like, okay, when we inhibit mTOR, we have an inhibition of the SASP, so probably what is happening is that some of these SASP mRNAs are being, the translation is being inhibited by mTOR. And we look into quite a lot, and that's just a sample of some of them. And what we typically saw is that, for example, for the canonical mTOR targets, translation, when once that we inhibit with, with M mTOR inhibitors for three hours, it will drop to less than, less than 5%. But for example, for all the SAS factors, we see a drop, and we see a drop almost with every mRNA that we look, because there's a, a general drop in translation. But uh, still, we have like something like 60 or 80 percent of the mRNAs that are associated with polysomes. So these, uh, these mRNAs are still being associated with polysomes, could be translated. So we thought that this could not be, or this, this cannot just explain how this uh, mTOR inhibition inhibits the production of the SAS. So it took us, so we, we we had this, this hypothesis and we tried a lot of different uh, mRNAs and we tried quite a lot of things. And at the end, the, the break came from another project that we were doing in the lab. And that made us understand that there was this, this mRNA of MK2. So this MK2, also called MAPCAPK2, is a protein kinase that is downstream of P38. And what we saw is that this mRNA was translated in a way that was very much dependent on mTOR. So in this case, when we repeated the experiments that we did before, and we treated with these uh, mTOR inhibitors, we can see that the association of this mRNA with the polysomes drops to very significant level, like around 10% or 20%. And for example, if we look into P38 or others, there's a drop, but still we have like 60% that is associated. More importantly, when we look into into the novel protein synthesis. So we just look into basically proteins that were produced, ones that we were just inhibiting with mTOR in, a, in just for four hours. We could see that 
canonical mTOR targets when we were just pulse giving these pulses, they were not being translated like EF2 and RPS20. That when we look into the canonical in the, to the translation of the SASP in these very short terms until and after mTOR inhibition, the SASP was uh, still being translated. But when we look into this MK2 kinase or MAP cap K2, so the translation dropped very dramatically in agreement with that. So potentially this could explain, so this was downstream of P38, so this could, this could explain how mTOR was controlling the SARS. So we know that mTOR through 4EBP controlled the translation initiation of certain targets. So one of them was the mRNA of MK2. So MK2 is downstream of P38. So P38 before has been shown that can control the SARS. So we thought that it, it makes sense that MK2 can control the SASP. So we look into that. We use MK2 chemical inhibitors. We use dominant negatives. Use, we use also SHRNAs. And we saw that if we inhibit MK2, we basically repress or prevent the SASP induction. And the question is, MK2 is a protein kinase, so it must be phosphorylating something. So what is that MK2 is phosphorylating that is controlling the, the SASP? So the, the data that we got there came from a phosphoproteomic study that we were doing on senescent cells. And we, was, we were looking into, translation, into phosphorylation happening on senescence and when we inhibit senescent cells with different mTOR inhibitors. And we found that there was like a substrate of MK2 that is this uh, RNA binding protein that is called CFP36L1 and the other name that it has is BRF1 that I will just refer to it because it's easier. And we saw that this BRF1 it was basically being phosphorylated during senescence. It was known to be an MK2 target so when we just inhibit MK2 the phosphorylation disappear. And importantly, when we, when we treat cells with mTOR inhibitors, the phosphorylation and the total levels of this protein disappear. And, and there is a complication here that I'm not going to enter into the detail, but basically the phosphorylation of this protein control its activity, but also control its, stabi its stability. So that complicates some of these studies. But that's a scheme that, that basically show how this protein works, this uh, BRF1 CFP36L1. So if it's not phosphorylated, it's active. It can bind to, to the AU rich elements of three, three primes of mRNAs and can degrade some of these mRNAs. So <laughs> importantly, there's a lot of SASP components and cytokines that have these AU rich elements in the mRNA. So the phosphorylation of this protein by MK2. <coughs> What it does is, is just uh, inactivate the protein, so it's phosphorylated in three sites, the protein becomes inactive, and also importantly, it becomes stabilized. So it, some of the studies in which we look into the phosphorylation and the total levels uh, get a bit complicated because we have like this dual effect on the activity and the uh, stabilization of the protein levels. But what we did is, is basically to generate a mutant of the protein that mutated the three phosphorylation sites for alanines, and then this protein could not be uh, phosphorylated, could not be inactivated, and will behave as a constitutively active version of the protein. And then what we will expect is that this constitutively active version of the protein will more efficiently degrade these mRNAs that have these AU rich elements in the three prime. And there are a lot of these SASP components that seem to have these AU rich elements on the three prime. So the prediction is that this constitutively active version will be a very efficient SASP uh, suppressor. And in, indeed that was the case. So we generate this constitutively active version, it suppresses the SASP, and we when we went to the mass spec, what we saw is that it suppresses the SASP even more potently than, for example, mTOR was doing. And uh, just, I'm not going to enter into the detail, but we can predict bioinformatically for the, for the mRNAs that have these AU rich elements, and what we could see is that the SAS factors that were basically uh, inhibited by mTOR, they were enriched in these AU rich elements in the three prime. So it was consistent with BRF1 playing a role in controlling their, their uh, stability. So at the end, what we come is with this complicated pathway in which mTOR inhibition suppresses the SASP through, if we inhibit mTOR, so mTOR, amongst other things, control for EBP. 4-EBP uh, controls the translation of the mRNA of this kinase, MK2, MAP, K2, that in turn phosphorylates and inactivates this RNA binding protein that degradates the, the 
mRNAs of SASP components. And at the end, what we achieve is through mTOR inhibition, we can inhibit the, the, or prevent the induction of the SASP. So in parallel to us showing that, there was another paper of Judy Campisi group that showed that another thing that mTOR controls through 4 EBP is the translation of interleukin-1 alpha. And through positive feedback loops, eventually that also results in controlling the, the presence of the SASP or the, the, the levels of the SASP. But one interesting question that we had is, okay, we saw that mTOR inhibits the SASP and what is, uh, we saw what, what could be the potential mechanism and there might be other mechanisms operating, but the question is, what's the functional implication of this? And the thing is that we saw that mTOR controls the SASP, but doesn't control all the factors secreted by senescent cells, just control a subset that is like half of that. And also we know that the SASP can have, for example, in the context of cancer, can have effects in tumor suppression and tumor promotion. So the question is, is probably double. So in, on one hand, is this subset of the SASP that is controlled by mTOR sufficient to control these phenotypes <coughs> and has a differential effect in this tumor suppression or tumor promotion? And that's a summary of what we saw before, many protomorogenic effect, many tumor suppressive effect. We tested quite a few, and just summarizing, so we tested, for example, amongst the protomorogenic effect, how inhibiting mTOR and the effect that that has on the SASP affects, for example, EMT and the, the growth of tumors in a paracrine fashion. And in the other hand, we tested whether this affect paracrine senescence or this adaptive immunity uh, response. And yes, I will show the results in the next couple of slides, but I'm just going to go very quickly. I'm not going to put much emphasis on that. But what I want to just uh, summarize is that if we inhibit mTOR, we affect both, or, or we inhibit both the tumors, the protomorogenic effects of the SAS, that probably that's something good and that we want to do, but we also suppress this tumor suppressive response. So the, that is something that if we, ha if we could choose, Eventually, what we will do, what we want to do, is just be, being able to suppress the protomorogenic effect, but maintaining this tumor suppressive response. And I have some data in the next two slides that this is published a couple of years ago. So I'm just going to mention that, for example, as as I mentioned, when we inhibit with mTOR, we can inhibit this paracrine senescent response, and we can also inhibit this uh, immune surveillance response in which immune cells are recruited to clear these preneoplastic senescent cells. So we are just basically affecting these tumor suppressive effects that uh, ideally we, w we don't want to affect. But on the other hand, for example, we decrease this EMT induction, so that that's something that is positive. And we have also different models in which we have like this, for example, fibroblast that we can make senescence. And when we co-inject this senescence fibroblast with cancer epithelial cells, what we can see is that the, uh, the xenografts, they become much bigger, so the tumors uh, grow much more quickly because of these senescence cells secreting all these pro-inflammatory factors. If we inhibit the secretion of factors with mTOR in these senescence cells, not affecting the tumor but in the senescence cells, what we can see is that we can dec decrease this protumorogenic effect. So that's, that's positive. So just summarizing this part, I think that what we want to say is that rapamycin can, on one hand, dissociate this growth arrest from the pro-inflammatory effects of senescence. And therefore, we could think that rapamycin could be used to suppress some of the, the detrimental effects of the SARS. But um, the, there are a few buts. Rapamycin is immunosuppressive, probably it's not the best drug to use. Uh, many doctors don't like to use it for, for many things. Rapamycin also suppress, as, as we saw, some of the tumor suppressive effects of the, f of the SASP, so we, we don't have a, a differential effect. And on the other hand, I showed you that rapamycin treated cells, uh, senescent cells remain arrested, but they remain arrested not because of senescence. So we can see that, okay, that the cells remain arrested, they don't incorporate BRDU, and they basically they don't grow. But what we can see also is that they decrease in these senescence markers like beta-gal, decrease in P16, decrease in B21, so they are not senescence anymore. And they are arrested basically because they have like low levels of cycling Ds, that that's something that rapamycin is not to do. So potentially what that can mean is that these cells could, if we just uh, withdraw rapamycin, they could escape. So that's not an ideal scenario, and that's why we have been looking for better strategies to suppress the SASP. And what I will try to do in the last five minutes is just to give an advance of what we have been 
try to, trying to do to, uh, to identify new self-regulators. And what we have been doing, that is something that I'm very happy to know that here you also like very much, is to do genetic screenings. And we have used a system of oncogen-induced senescence, where we can just induce senescence by treating cells with tamoxifen that activate RAS. And we have a screen both some, uh, some small compound libraries, but also siRNA libraries. And we have looked for, uh, especially for the production of IL-8 IL and IL-6 in senescent cells. So we have looked into those, into those two specific pro-inflammatory factors. So we have here have like non-senescent cells. So here we have senescent cells and they are expressing IL-8 and IL-6. And for example, if we just inhibit NF-kappa-B or CBP or P38, we can prevent the induction of IL-8 of IL-6. And Athena, that is a student in, in my lab that uh, is just finishing this story, so she has set up all the screening. And we have looked for, we have a screen, apart of other things, an 8,000 uh, gene, uh, an SIRN library targeting 8,000 genes. And we have identified things that both uh, repress the SASP and SIRNAs that also enhance the production of some of these fa SAS factors. And I think that's the summary. So we have, at the end, from the 1,000 that we screen, we have like something around 100 SIRNAs that activate IL-8, sorry, that activate IL-8 and IL-6, and 100 that repress IL-8 and IL-6. We concentrate on the SIRNAs that repress the SASP. So we did a secondary screening using different SARNAs to validate that. We validate most of them, so it was, was quite good. And from this, we potentially 96 genes that are repressing the SASP, what we thought is that this could be repressing the SASP for many reasons. One is that they could be inhibiting senescence, and then we don't have senescence, and as a consequence, we don't have SASP. And on the other hand, we could have some SARNAs that specifically were repressing the SASP. So we will still have a senescent response, cells arrested, but specifically repress the SASP. So we look into that, and what we did is, is for this, we re-screened re re for what was happening with BRDU, with P16 and P21, and what we found was a bit of everything. So there was like some SIRNAs that indeed, what they were doing is bypassing the sen or preventing the senescent response, and as a consequence, we didn't have SASP. But we become interested in what we call this cluster one, that in which we have like, I think it was 49 SIRNAs targeting 49 genes that specifically suppress IL-8 and IL-6, but the cells remain arrested. So they remain BRDU low, P16 high, P21 high. And just very quickly, we, we got like 49 genes in, this, in that cluster. Amongst those, there was already nine that there was like commercial drugs, and we have tested some of these commercial drugs, and they inhibit the SASP in some settings with more or less access. That's quite interesting. There are many candidates that they are biologically interesting. So for example, we are working, and I will show a couple of slides, in a candidate that is a factor controlling alternative splicing, and I think that there's quite a, potentially quite a cool mechanism by which this is controlling the SASP. And one of the questions that I just want to show you like a taste of that is, okay, we hear a screen for things that were controlling IL-8 and IL-6, but I show you that this SASP, or what we call SASP, is more than 100 or so different secreted factors on senescent cells. So are all these 49 candidates that we have here controlling the SASP in a, in a same way, or they are having differential effects? So in Athena, that she's a fearless student, so did, she did this massive experiment in which Basically, she did like 276 RNA-seq uh, sample experiments. So she, she scaled this down, and she just did it in a way that was affordable for us, so scaling down quite a lot. And with help of the bioinformatics, we figured out what was the, the limit that we have uh, still uh, relevant information for the SASP, and we could scale it down that we didn't become green. And what we, what we got is, so this is just a picture of, here we have like the SARNA, so basically, yes, SARNAs from the screening, and we can see that they, some of them cluster together, and, and this is just the SASP genes. And very quickly what we can see is that from the screening there are some SARNAs that seem to be acting in a similar way, so they are just regulating the SASP in the same way. And on the other hand, when we look into the SASP, there seem to be also clusters. And when you look into these things, so there are like some, some part here that is more pro-inflammatory, here more fibrogenic, here we have like the MMPs, so potentially what we can, we can tell is that 
if we use different of these uh, sRNAs, we could be affecting uh, specifically the inflammatory part, but maybe not the fibrogenic part, or the other way around. So, and just to show a simpler picture of that, so here is just all the SARS, but again, here we have all the sRNAs, and we're just concentrating to four components. IL-8 and IL-6 is what we screen for, so it's just suppressed across. There are things like CCL20 that are regulated in a very similar way, and we see that, okay, that is also suppressing all of them. But if we look into other things like CCL2, and CCL2 is very important, for example, for NK recruitment and for many other things, what we can see is that amongst our hits, there are like half of them that seem to repress CCL2 and half of them not. So potentially, what we think that we want or we, we can do from here is just to try to have like different strategies so that we could just basically reprogram the SASP and just try to see whether by using some of these combinations, eventually we can decrease some of these tumor suppressive effects while maintaining some of the functions that maybe they are like beneficial. And just to finish, so just to show some of the data with the alternative splicing factor. So as, as, I, as I told you, these are four SHRNAs and the, this alternative splicing factor, the cells remain arrested. And in this case, contrary to what I, I told you with with rapamycin, so they, are, they remain beta-gal positive, remain P16 positive, remain P21 positive, so they are really arrested. And they have like a, dec a specific decrease in, for example, IL-8, IL-6, and some of the pro-inflammatory components of the SASP. So in particular, this factor is one of the ones that does not repress CCL2. And what we can see when we compare, for example, with mTOR, is that there are like some things that they regulate in common, but there are also some things that are specific, uh, specifically regulated by one or by the other. So there is this potential for a specific or differential effect regulating the SASP in different ways. And this is the picture that I showed you before, and I told you that eventually what we want to try is to get a situation in which we suppress the protumorogenic effect of the SASP, but we still maintain some of the tumor suppressive. And we have started to look for example, with this uh, targeting this alternative splicing factor into some of these effects. And I think that situations are probably not as simple as that, and there are things that are more complicated. But for example, what I can tell you is that if we inhibit this alternative splicing factor, we inhibit the, the protumorogenic effect of the SASP. But for example, we maintain some tumor suppressive effects of the SASP, like, for example, the recruitment of NK cells to kill these senescent cells. And we know that this is mediated by the fact that uh, CCL2 is still being produced. So it's not as simple as that, because there, uh, there are a lot of things that we cannot dissociate so simply, and, and there are many effects that are not uh, going to be dissociated as simply as this. But this is what we are trying to understand, whether there is a way that rationally we can just try to get better ways of, of manipulating the SASP. And just to finish, just conclude that the SASP is an important mediator of the effects of senescent cells. Both its components and its regulation can be, we believe, targeted for therapeutic use. And depending on the scenario, maybe we want to suppress or amend the SASP, or potentially what we want to do is to affect it in a, in a way, what we call this reprogramming, that is a differential effect on the SASP. And we hope that from our past and our ongoing research, we will be able to understand a bit better how this works mechanistically and try to see whether we can use it for some therapeutic settings. And just to acknowledge the people that have done the work, so a lot of the staff initial work on the SAS was started by Juan Carlos Acosta, that he now has his group in Edinburgh, and Ana Benito, that was a PhD student, and now he's going to start as a, as a group head in, in Heidelberg after doing a postdoc. And uh, Nico has been, and Suchira have been working on the effects of mTOR, and Athena has been doing this uh, screening on, uh, on SARS regulation. So thank you.